All right, well, uh, good morning, and uh, my name is uh, Jacob Hudson. I go by Jake, though, and uh, looking forward to this opportunity this morning to uh, present my research uh, for this semester for human <clears throat> sexual development uh, to each of you. Uh, as I approach this topic, and I uh, started to look at the different sections that uh, we were asked to explore uh, concerning individual personalities as well as um, the uh, interpersonal effects concerning human sexual development uh, and the uh, sexual uh, development from a clinical practice standpoint. Uh, I'm going to admit I was a little overwhelmed, I guess you could say, at first. And so my intention was to try to shrink those areas and hopefully I stay within uh, the bounds of what was expected concerning this research, but I tried to focus in on some specific aspects of each one of these areas. So in doing so, as you can see, I've uh, titled both my paper as well as this presentation, uh, Human Sexual Development, a Micro Review. As we begin to look at this, um, the topic of human sexual development obviously covers a, a large um, amount of information. Uh, the ways sexual development affect each individual often varies, of course, and trying to draw clear answers to certain issues uh, in reality is an impossible task at times. And so uh, it was the aim of this research, again, as I mentioned, to focus in on uh, these three specific areas of human sexual development, which are... Uh, sexual development individual personalities, sexual development and interpersonal relationships, and then finally sexual development as it relates to clinical practice. Now I want to start out by saying as I looked through uh, several of these articles and researched throughout the past couple of weeks, came across a lot of really interesting um, studies that have been done, some statistics that uh, I've found very beneficial uh, to my current work. I currently work as a youth and family minister for the Louisville Church of Christ in the Dallas-Fort Worth area of Texas, and um, especially from an adolescent standpoint and looking at uh, the human sexual development both over the course of this semester as well as in relation to this research uh, this morning, I found a, a lot of uh, different articles and, and research that has been done that has uh, greatly helped me in uh, my current work. I hope the uh, articles that we're going to look at this morning you'll find uh, very beneficial as well and some of the points that they brought up. So as we look at um, these three areas, Obviously, each of them can be uh, quite vast as well. So, uh, my intention of, of this particular study is to um, specify certain practical areas in each of the related fields that, that we mentioned a moment ago. So, in particular, when it comes to uh, the first area, sexual development of individual personalities, we're going to take a look at uh, parental involvement, uh, psychological effects of puberty in relation to um, individual personality, and then also um, pornography and how it affects uh, the development of uh, an adolescent and the personality to go along with that. Um, second, the effects of, of childhood uh, sexual abuse as well as partner responsiveness are going to be discussed in relation to sexual development 
and interpersonal relationships. And then finally, what I'm going to attempt to do is um, talk a little bit about mental health implications from uh, sexual development and uh, discuss those in relation to uh, sexual development and clinical practice. Now, in each of these sections, as well as the subsections, um, we'll try to spend a little bit speaking of the negative and or positive effects of each of these areas as we move through uh, the study this morning. So let's go ahead and, and we'll get started uh, with the first section dealing with sexual development and individual personalities. Uh, sexual development affects each individual in both similar and different ways. Obviously, there are some similar um, circumstances that, that we all go through, um, but then there's obviously many different circumstances that we all face through uh, the sexual development in our lifetimes. Those differences can be classified in a, a majority of ways. Uh, for example, uh, there's gender differences. Uh, male and female and their uh, transitions through uh, human sexual development and the different hurdles that uh, both classes face. There's also uh, differences when it comes to uh, society and culture, uh, where we live. Uh, who we live around, the type of town we're from, for instance, can even play a role in how we develop sexually, the amount of exposure that we have. Um, obviously, in more poverty-stricken areas, there may be a higher uh, case of, of sexual immorality and so forth, and thus there may be differences in uh, sexual maturity or exposure to sexuality at earlier ages. All these factors can, can come into play, and of course, we could spend um, multiple class section, sessions, as we have, uh, talking about some of the different factors related. Um, so, uh, again, there, there's so many contributing factors, gender, age of onset, parental style, many others. I, I've chosen three specifically uh, for my research. Um, that we want to look at this morning. The first of those is parental involvement. Now, parental involvement uh, can be looked at from a few different angles, but parental involvement is referring to the amount of um, involvement that, that either the mother or the father or the parent figure in the family has within a, a child and parent relationship. Uh, several studies have shown this particular relationship between the parent and child to be important. Specifically, uh, in three areas we'll highlight this morning, are sexual intercourse, safer sex practices, and then uh, just a higher sexual understanding overall. I've included at the end of uh, this PowerPoint uh, this morning all the different uh, sources that I used in the course of this research and so uh, you'll have those available to you to look over and if you would like to further study and uh, read their conclusions uh, that led me to some of the conclusions that I've made this morning you're welcome to do that. There have been numerous uh, studies that report associations between parenting styles and sexual behavior in the past Obviously, understandably so, uh, parents and other parental figures within an adolescent's life have a high impact on the development of an individual, regardless of whether it is related to uh, sexuality or, or not. Parents, again, vary in, in parenting style. Um, some tend to be more authoritative, while others are more lax. And as such, the development of the adolescents in their care is going to vary as well. Uh, there's three factors that, that we want to talk about this morning in relation to parenting and uh, psychosexual development. 
And these three factors, as you can see, are support, control, and knowledge. So let's start out with uh, support for the time being. Uh, support here in this context refers to the expression of affection, love, and appreciation. As such, it encompasses uh, traits such as warmth and availability, responsiveness, and closeness. It's rather obvious, it seems, that the amount of parental support within the child and parent relationship is going to play a major role in the child's development, and specifically, the, the child's sexual development. If the child feels that, uh, for instance, the parent is sincere or available or even responsive, and, and their overall relationship with the parent is close, uh, then the child will more than likely feel a bit more at ease when discussing sexuality with his or her parents. As the study uh, by DeGraff shows, when it comes to uh, sexual intercourse, nearly all previous studies have discovered that a higher parental support variable is associated with a delay of first sexual intercourse. And so simply what that means is the relationship, the stronger it is between uh, the parent and the child, uh, as far as support is concerned, then the less likely it is that the child will have uh, sexual intercourse early on in his or her life. Now, <clears throat> another area that has been shown to be affected uh, by parental support is the use of uh, protection, contraception, or some other type of protection. In fact, uh, several studies have shown that young people use contraception more consistently if they are more satisfied with the uh, maternal relationship, in interestingly enough, or if they experience more support, involvement in school, or positive communication styles from their parents. Now, this uh, seems to correlate with the uh, idea mentioned previously that the parental relationship with the child does indeed have an effect on the child's sexual development and decision-making, thus forming their personality. Finally, under this uh, idea of support, um, parental support has also been found to relate to uh, later in life when the child uh, hopefully becomes an adult and engages in a sexual relationship, preferably with their spouse. Um, parental support has uh, been found to relate to pleasurable sexual experiences when the child enters into that stage of his or her life. In fact, a number of studies report associations between uh, parent parental support and positive feelings regarding sexuality or competence in sexual interactions uh, when that child has that good support network with their parents as an adolescent. So it seems the uh, positive relationship between the parent and child uh, cultivates a deeper sense of, of sexual maturity uh, when the child uh, fully matures into an adult. Now the second area of, of parental involvement I want to talk about is control. Control simply refers to parenting behavior that is intended to direct the child's behavior uh, in the manner desired by the parents. Okay, so, so parenting styles obviously differ greatly in this area. I can think back on uh, my childhood and in my teen years. Um, some of my best friends, each of us uh, obviously were raised by parents with different parenting styles. Um, I know I had some friends whose parents were extremely lax when it came to um, their involvement with their children. Uh, it was more of a simple caretaker type of relationship. I also had parents, or excuse me, friends who had parents who were extremely authoritative in their approach to parenting. As a result, there was extensive uh, rules that were expected to be followed by the children uh, living in the household. 
Uh, and then, of course, there are parents who are kind of in between the two. They're not authoritative necessarily, but then at the same time, they're not just extremely lax in their involvement. And there's a balance between uh, individuality and allowing that child to experience things and to grow on their own, but there's also structure and um, maybe not as harsh of a set of rules for that child to follow. All of these describe control in this context. So saying that, obviously, each of those friends from my childhood, as well as myself, um, the amount of control that the parents uh, used in those relationships or displayed in those relationships also had an effect on uh, the personality of each of us. And so keeping that in mind, uh, again, parenting styles obviously differ greatly. Uh, on one end of the spectrum, there are those who are extremely authoritative. They create an extremely sheltered environment for their children. Of course, the negative to this is that the child um, doesn't gain as much uh, responsibility due to uh, the lack of the child's opportunity to make decisions for him or herself. Now, on the other end, there are those who have very little to do with guiding their children, and they certainly don't offer any type of structure in the children's lives. Most of the studies that are, are being conducted concerning the effects of control on, on sexual experience have shown that higher levels of control uh, correlate with a delay in first sexual intercourse. However, overprotective parenting has shown to be an exception to this finding, and I, I found that interesting. In other words, um, higher levels of control are good to an extent, but there can be a, a line that can be drawn to where if they cross that line and become too overprotective, then it can have negative consequences. Children of, of overprotective, um, also known as authoritarian parents, are more likely to have sexual intercourse earlier in life. Now, on a related note, the parenting style also has an effect on uh, pleasurable sexual experiences later in the child's life as well. It seems that the best parenting style would be somewhere between no control at all and then just overbearing control. Again, this all adds specifically to uh, the personality development of this individual uh, when it comes to uh, their sexual development. Finally is uh, knowledge. Now, knowledge uh, defined here is, is generally referred to as uh, monitoring. Um, this is perhaps the final factor concerning parenting and, and psychosexual development. Uh, both cross-sectional and longitudinal studies have found that higher levels of knowledge are related to a delay of first sexual intercourse. In other words, the more monitoring of a parent, the more a parent uh, knows what's going on in the child's life, has uh, direct implications to uh, the child's sexual development and also the child's sexual expression. The relationship, um, or this correlation, shows the importance of a close relationship uh, between parents and children. The relationship needs to have an ongoing, open conversation in order to create an environment of trust and knowledge, and all of these add to the development of the personality when it comes to uh, sexual development within the adolescent. Uh, the next area that I want to talk about dealing with individual personalities are the psychological effects of puberty. Obviously, there are uh, is a ton of change that takes place both in male and female adolescents uh, when puberty sets in. All of these changes have the potential to affect this individual's personality. Um, saying that as children grow and mature, obviously they're bombarded with an array of both physical and mental 
uh, hurdles that they have to overcome. Uh, expectations, for example, hormonal changes, uh, physical changes, relationships, and just the onslaught of new emotions are, are just a few of these challenges that adolescents will face on the onset of puberty. Um, again, the bulk of these challenges occur around the onset and throughout the course of puberty. And each child will negotiate these challenges differently. As a result, their personalities uh, will um, vastly differ in the development of those. However, it's been shown that both the timing and the tempo of puberty can affect uh, the child psychologically. And what we mean by this is timing being uh, the timing of the onset of puberty itself. Uh, if the child is younger, it can cause differences. Uh, if the child is older, it can cause certain differences. And then tempo referring to how quickly the child progresses through uh, puberty in his or her life. Uh, both of these things, timing and tempo, can have uh, a great effect on the personality of that individual in relation to their sexual development through puberty. For example, uh, early pubertal timing and girls and boys both uh, significantly predicted a more severe level of depressive symptoms. Uh, it would seem that, that the less mature mind in particular uh, struggles more with all the corresponding pubertal uh, changes. So in other words, that the younger an individual is at the onset of puberty, uh, it's been shown to be harder for them to uh, negotiate some of the obstacles that come along with those changes in their life. Uh, timing is, again, not the only area of interest as the pace or the tempo at which some individuals progress through puberty, uh, again, has been shown to have psychological effects as well. Uh, Mendel in his research noted that uh, a faster than average developmental tempo might uh, demand an improbably swift assimilation of new biological and social milestones. It may evoke different and potentially stronger reactions from uh, parents, from peers, uh, from teachers, and also compress the time available for resolution of the developmental task of the pre-adolescent period. Simply put, um, the tempo of uh, the individual experiences puberty at um, can greatly affect that individual's uh, development, sexual development, as well as that individual's personality. Now, while both timing and tempo are predictors in, in psychological issues that may occur in children during puberty, there has been a, a notable difference between boys and girls. And I found this interesting, that, that timing was the strongest predictor of uh, depressive symptoms in girls, and tempo was the strongest predictor in boys. And so uh, I found that to be quite interesting, that girls who reach uh, the onset of puberty at an earlier age tend to struggle with depressive symptoms, whereas it doesn't affect boys as much, but yet the tempo, in other words, the rate at which uh, the young boys go through the course of puberty um, tends to bring on depressive symptoms in boys. I think there is quite an interesting, um, some interesting research that can be done uh, relating to that uh, in another setting. The third thing I want to talk about when it comes to personality development uh, as far as um, sexual development is, is concerned is the effect that, that pornography has. Uh, it's no secret that today that pornography has infiltrated just about every uh, aspect of, of consumable media that there is. Uh, pornography continues to be a psychological and emotional danger in the many uh, of lives today. 
the availability of pornographic material uh, grows daily, particularly on the internet. Uh, it spreads at a rapid pace. Now on top of this, technology has allowed for um, many ways to access this material. Uh, not just at a computer where it can be monitored anymore, but we have cell phones and tablets and uh, access to the internet just all over the place. So society's access to multiple devices that access the internet is, is also expanding rapidly, complicating this problem even further. Uh, it doesn't take much to imagine the effects of uh, pornography on an adolescent as they're uh, developing sexually and also the effect that that will have on their their personality as, as they continue to develop. Uh, these studies uh, that have taken place, there's been several studies that have been conducted concerning the effects of pornography on the psychological development of an adolescent as well as on adults. Um, but these studies have shown that pornography use is related to a stronger <clears throat> endorsement of permissive and uh, recreational attitudes towards sex and to earlier and more advanced experience with sexual behavior. Now outside of, of morality, uh, morality obviously being the greatest issue from a, a Christian perspective, but outside of morality perhaps the greatest issue with pornographic material is associated with the one-sided portrayal of sexuality that it contains. Uh, and what I'm saying is it's, it's kind of like, um, <laughs> forgive the uh, illustration here, it's just the only one coming to mind at the moment, but it's kind of like the uh, fake reality that is sometimes um, exposed in Disney movies. You know, um, I remember uh, reading an article once on the um, false expectations that uh, Disney movies can create for young girls, especially when it comes to finding Prince Charming and living happily ever after. Well, uh, when it comes to pornography, um, the material that is uh, displayed often uh, depicts unrealistic, unrealistic expectations, and it can recreate a, a false understanding of sexual reality later in life. <laughs> I'm sorry for... Uh, just relating pornography with uh, Disney films, but uh, like I said, my mind runs rampant at the time. So, uh, nonetheless, uh, the reality is that uh, pornography can uh, obviously alter an individual's personality, especially in the sexual department, um, due to the unrealistic expectations that can be developed at such a young age and carry, carried with the individual throughout their lifetime. Um, so that kind of sums us up with the, the personality effects of human sexual development and brings us to the next section, uh, human sexual development in the context of interpersonal relationships. Again, much could be said concerning uh, the topic of, of sexual development when it comes to interpersonal relationships, uh, much like the, the previous uh, point that we looked at. Um, we're going to take a moment to, to look at, at two specific areas uh, concerning interpersonal relationships. Uh, the first of these is sexual abuse. Um, sexual abuse can obviously harm an individual's ability to nurture interpersonal and develop interpersonal relationships later in life. Child sexual abuse uh, has been repeatedly linked with uh, poor mental and physical health outcomes for those who experience it. Uh, for instance, some of these outcomes include uh, depression, post-traumatic uh, post stress disorder, PTSD, uh, anger, physical symptoms, as well as medical diagnoses. Uh, you know, you can go down the list of individuals um, or uh, difficulties that individuals have faced due to sexual abuse uh, during their developmental years. Um, and that list, unfortunately, is, is vast. It, it's not hard, I don't think, for one to imagine the drastic 
uh, and negative impact that sexual abuse will have on an individual's uh, present and future interpersonal relationships. Uh, it, it alters the natural course of sexual development to the point that it does create uh, a negative effect on the child's uh, and eventually adult's ability to create and nurture interpersonal relationships when it comes to sexual development. Often the personalities uh, of those affected uh, are altered. They become uh, generally withdrawn from others. And along with these personality issues, uh, certain uh, key aspects associated with interpersonal relationships are jeopardized by the trauma caused by sexual abuse. For instance, uh, trust and intimacy and other uh, types of, of feelings associated with those are all jeopardized um, during the development of uh, sexuality uh, due to uh, the abuse that, that an individual has suffered. Uh, for example, one study suggests that women who experience sexual abuse as children have lower personal resilience and uh, psychological functioning, which adversely impacts important aspects of women's interpersonal relationships and overall sexual health in intimate relationships. Uh, so there have been studies that have shown um, that again, uh, even with gender differences, that there are obstacles um, that are placed in the context of sexual development when it comes to sexual abuse. Another area that I want to focus on this morning concerning interpersonal relationships is uh, associated with the partner's responsiveness uh, and its effects on sexual development and the interpersonal relationship. There are many areas to study concerning sexual development and interpersonal relationships, but the role partners play uh, should not be left out. And unfortunately, I feel... Uh, at times that, that um, those outside forces such as partner responsiveness tend to be overlooked um, when looking at an individual's sexual development. Uh, perhaps one of the areas that this affects most or um, groups of individuals that this affects most are those in later stages of sexual development. Uh, generally, sexual desire gradually subsides over time in long-term relationships. So let's take an a early marriage, for example. Uh, you have the honeymoon years, right, where you're still in love and you're experiencing that, that sexual attraction and so forth. But as kids come and uh, time comes and, and all the uh, fun effects of that, such as getting a, a, a gut on you and your skin sagging and all those types of things come into play, well, uh, sexual desire tends to slow. Now, of course, there are chemicals involved in this as well, uh, hormones that begin to um, be less present in the body and so forth. But nonetheless, um, studies have shown that, that partner response plays a vital role <coughs> in keeping sexual desire alive. Uh, for example, um, Brinbaum in his research uh, quotes saying, Sexual desire is among the strongest forces in human nature, one that may induce overwhelming pleasures and intensely meaningful experiences or profound yearning and or disappointment. He concludes by saying, As such, it plays a major role not only in attracting potential partners, to each other, but also in promoting and enduring a bond between them. So it would seem inappropriate not to consider the partner's role in the development of the relationship as well as the individual's uh, sexual development. Um, individuals who believe that, that their partners understand and appreciate them, for, exists, or, uh, for instance, experience greater desire to have sex with them. Um, in contrast, the opposite is true of those who do not feel understood and cared for by their partners. So in, in short, the relationship outside the bedroom greatly contributes to the relationship inside the bedroom. 
and thus the, the partner's role concerning an individual's sexual development is a vital aspect to the health of that development and in particular the relationship uh, that is uh, attempting to be nurtured between those two individuals. The last section that, that we want to uh, cover this morning I, I spent a little bit more time on and that is human sexual development as it relates to clinical practice. Um, again, this, this final section focuses on sexual development and its implication in clinical practice. Uh, there's several different situations that could be analyzed from a clinical standpoint. Uh, but once again, I, I've tried to choose only a few uh, to briefly discuss this morning. Um, the ones that we're going to look at this morning include short-term relationships or uh, as referred to today uh, in the modern culture, I guess you could say, hooking up or hookups uh, and the clinical risk involved with that type of sexual behavior. Uh, we also want to talk a little bit about homosexuality and some of the associated psychological issues that can uh, occur and be experienced in a clinical setting. And then finally, um, something that I found rather interesting is the sexual stigma associated with mental illness. And so we're going to discuss each of these uh, just briefly this morning. So let's start out with uh, short-term relationships, or uh, simply put, hooking up. Uh, the the issue related here deals with an ongoing increase um, in today's society, uh, specifically Western societies, in short-term sexual relationships. Uh, a hookup, as you can see here, um, may include a wide range of, of sexual behaviors, from kissing to oral sex to actual penetrative intercourse. Uh, Garcia in the research, defined hooking up as uh, what you have before you here, a brief, uncommitted sexual encounter among individuals who are not romantic partners or dating each other. Um, obviously, a survey of, of today's popular media shows, um, television shows, movies, and even um, top songs across the billboard charts promote this idea of hooking up as acceptable and sensible. Thus, uh, I think it's safe to say that the uh, shame that was once involved in such actions has all but diminished completely, and with it, I, I believe, a sense of morality when it comes to sexuality. Now, unfortunately, the issue is not confined to just one gender or the other. Uh, studies have shown that the mentality of, of short-term sexual relationships is similar across genders, and this is definitely something I believe we will face uh, in a clinical setting. Uh, several psychological and physical issues have been associated uh, through studies with such behavior. <clears throat> Saying that, the uh, negative consequences of hookups uh, can include a vast amount of things. It can include emotional and, and psychological injury, um, sexual violence, sexually transmitted diseases, and or unintended pregnancy. All of these have the ability to affect the sexual development of an individual, and all of these are very um, real when it comes to clinical settings. Obviously, these consequences can all lead to psychological clinical implications. Unfortunately, <clears throat> it's been shown that the longer an individual engages in this type of sexual behavior, the greater the psychological risk become. In particular, feelings of loneliness, uh, lack of self-esteem, depression, and or anxiety uh, can present themselves in a clinical setting when such behavior is consistently engaged in in an individual's life. Any of these uh, can lead to serious mental disorders requiring an individual to seek professional help and counsel. Uh, a second area um, 
that is contemporary with, with clinical practice is homosexuality. Homosexuality has been uh, or has created quite a stir in the field of, of psychology over the years, uh, especially in recent years uh, as the lifestyle has become more prevalent in modern culture. Of course, with uh, the last year being an election year and all the drama that goes on uh, during those times, one of the hot button issues, as usual, in the last couple of decades was that of homosexuality. Uh, the fact of the matter is, regardless of your stance, your moral stance on the issue, homosexuals can and often do face multiple mental health issues. And they often experience higher than expected levels of psychiatric disorders. Uh, several factors lead into this psychological distress. Um, I think a few worth mentioning this morning are the process of coming out. When an individual decides that he or she is going to uh, publicly announce that they are practicing homosexuals or they have um, homosexual uh, tendencies, there's obviously uh, psychological stress involved with that because of uh, the possibility of, of rejection not only from family, but also from friends and just others in general. Uh, there's also a stigma stress that goes along with that. And what I mean by that is the perceived concept of homosexuality and what others may think of that individual. The stigma that's often related with homosexuality in today's culture can create and cultivate uh, psychological issues within the individual. There's the fear of violence, um, as uh, expression has uh, become quiet, rampant today. Uh, this one has tapered some, but there is still obviously um, discrimination that can be involved, uh, and even to some extent violent uh, altercations can occur simply because of the individual um, being homosexual. So that violence can obviously add to the psychological effects of being a homosexual. Also, um, rejection uh, can occur. We mentioned that a moment ago. Uh, there's a high rate of, of homelessness, uh, especially in younger um, individuals who are uh, homosexual um, mainly because of rejection and the, and the fear of uh, your parents kicking you to the curb, so to speak, uh, can obviously create and cultivate psychological issues. Um, there's also a high association with substance abuse because of things such as depression and anxiety and other unwanted feelings um, that come with uh, some of the fears associated with homosexuality. And then ultimately the upper echelon, obviously, suicidal behavior due to violence or rejection or bullying or however you want to put that due to the individual's lifestyle. Each of these factors uh, can cause adverse, effect, uh, excuse me, adverse effects, uh, especially adverse psychological effects on those who uh, experience them. Another area of psychological stress uh, in relation to homosexuality is known as minority stress. Uh, those who have alternative sexual lifestyles face the burden of holding a minority status, and whether you like it or not, a minority status carries with it um, a burden even today. Uh, they're often vulnerable to such things as, as prejudice and discrimination. And as a result, these experiences are often internalized and thus result in the future clinical implications as well. The last area of uh, clinical practice concerning human sexual development that I want to talk about is the uh, effect of, of sexual stigma. Uh, from a, a clinical standpoint, this deals with the sexual stigma that is placed on those with mental illness. 
Now, you may or may not have thought of this before, but um, there is the stigma in general of mental illness uh, that has been associated with, with discrimination across the board, whether it be education, uh, housing, workforce, health, mental health, and even judicial environments. Um, individuals with mental illness have uh, suffered a, a stigma, if you will, uh, once their illness has been brought to light. Therefore, it's not really surprising to realize that sexual stigma occurs for those who are mentally ill as well. Now, while there are some mental illnesses that can be associated with, with uh, uh, sexual abnormalities, this isn't always the case. Um, psychopathic sexuality, for example, can obviously the, the effects of that mental illness can um, change the way an individual views sex and can also alter that individual's sexuality uh, compared to what may be considered normal in society. Um, but again, that's not always the case. In fact, studies have shown that individuals with, with mental illness experience uh, an often internalized stigma related to their sexual relationships. And so what we mean then is, is an individual seeking psychological help is likely to fit into this fact. And as a therapist, we need to be aware of the possible implications for the patient. Individuals who suffer from mental illness have been uh, shown to be hypersensitive to others' thoughts about them. And this doesn't exclude uh, sexuality by any means. This may lead to, to one of two possibilities uh, studies have shown. First, uh, the individual may attempt to internalize the problem. Uh, and if that happens, of course, the problem isn't ever dealt with and the individual carries around kind of that burden of that stigma, always worrying about and always thinking about what uh, a sexual partner or even uh, others may think of them. And as a result, it complicates that their psychological problems that they're already facing. But then the, the alternative is also true, and that's that the individual may simply attempt to explain their condition to their sexual partner. Um, and when this takes place, of course, the individual is going to be facing an extreme state of vulnerability. In either case, the complications of the individual's mental state may occur, leading to further clinical implications. So as we uh, finish up here this morning, um, we've tried to, or I've tried to cover the vast field of human sexual development, and I've tried to do it from a practical standpoint, meaning I've tried to focus in on very certain aspects of human sexual development uh, related to the three areas assigned, the first, of course, being the individual personalities and the way that, for instance, parents' involvement um, affects those personalities. Pornography affects the development of those personalities um, and other areas. Also, uh, interpersonal relationships we've spoken of this morning and how different aspects of uh, our lives can have an effect on, on our interpersonal relationships, whether it be a, a history of sexual abuse or even the way that we perceive our partner responds to us, whether it's in a positive or a negative way. And then finally, in the area of, of clinical practice, um, we've discussed um, a few different areas that may be of concern or likely will be of concern in a clinical setting uh, to us as, as we get to that point in our profession. Uh, the first of those being um, the growing uh, idea of short-term sexual relationships that is becoming ever more prevalent in our society today. Um, the psychological effects of homosexuality uh, that many will deal with um, as they seek help in a clinical setting. 
And then finally, as we just finished discussing, uh, the sexual stigma that often goes along with the general stigma concerning those suffering from mental uh, illnesses or disorders. Um, it's my, my hope that uh, what I've had to uh, present to you this morning has been beneficial. Uh, to be honest, it's my hope that it's uh, worthy of a good grade as well. Um, but nonetheless, uh, in the context of, of human sexual development in all three of these areas, uh, individual personalities, interpersonal relationships, as well as clinical practice, uh, the end goal has been to better understand certain issues related to human sexual development. Um, so that uh, myself and you and others who are pursuing a career in, in mental health may better be equipped to help individuals uh, feel better when they leave our offices. I think we would all agree that uh, feeling better is the one clue that the counseling process is on a productive path. Again, I appreciate uh, your time this morning. And uh, I want to wish all of you uh, good luck in the weeks ahead as you all uh, have your attempt to uh, present your research as well this semester. I've enjoyed uh, the discussion boards and continue to enjoy those. I'm a couple of weeks behind at this moment, but nonetheless, I've enjoyed reading your comments um, concerning the prompts that we've been giving this semester. So... Again, thank you for your time this morning, and uh, I hope you have a great day.